is about the design of evil. Now, you're a smart, skeptical person. So I hear you saying, wait a minute, Chris, evil is a pretty tricky word. Which kind of evil do you mean? I mean, if we go back to Socrates, who through Plato in the Mino dialogues, super nerd reference number one, um, you'll remember that he said that nobody in the real world commits what they believe is evil. By the time they commit the act that someone else would reasonably describe as evil, they have already gone through the mental gymnastics to tell themselves that, oh, it's not evil, or I'm part of a group that is exceptional, and it's okay if I subjugate someone else or someone outside this group. So in the real world, it's really hard to point unequivocally at something and say, ah, yes, that's evil. Though there are some recent examples that might be more clear than when I originally developed this content. Um, but there is a place that we can turn where we have unequivocal evil, and that is narrative. Narrative gives us characters and organizations and technologies that were created for the purpose of being evil in the story, being the villain, being the thing that the protagonist has to overcome. So we do have this repository of evil that we can look at without the nuanced uh, complications of the real world. Um, if I were a genre generalist, then I might be able to talk about evil as it is manifest across many different types of media, but I am not. Uh, for the past 12 years, writing the book, publishing the book, running the blog for the nine years since its publication, um, what I know really well is science fiction. And science fiction is a visual, uh, so I'm sorry, science fiction movies and television, to be precise, uh, which is handy because that means that we get to look at the evil interfaces throughout sci-fi and say, okay, well, when we put all these evil interfaces together, what patterns do we see? Um, if you want more of this content, I'm sure I'll be repeating this a couple of times over the course of the talk, you can go to scifiinterfaces.com where uh, I deconstruct movies typically on an individual basis, but occasionally do some uh, things like this, broad-based studies like what's evil or uh, how does gender play out in AI or um, all sorts of nerdery like that. Okay, the first thing that we notice when we gather all the evil interfaces together is that sometimes evil does not adhere to a pattern. In fact, all four of the interfaces that you see on this screen are evil interfaces. Um, they include Barbarella and Star Trek and the fifth element and, um, oh my God, I was gonna say Prometheus, but this avatar in the upper right hand corner. And these don't really fit into the patterns that we see and that I'm going to talk about. Evil is as evil does, and if it happens to adhere to a pattern, well, that's just gravy for our analysis. Um, I would not say that evil an interface is evil because of the way it looks. First, I want to look at what it does, how it is used, then declare it as evil, and then look at the patterns. Okay? So that aside, that not every interface fits into a pattern, there are two things that occur very frequently when you look at all the interfaces that are evil. The first is that evil is red on black. About 75% of the interfaces that I uh, gathered together fit into this pattern, red on black. Now, not all of them fit red on black, right? And not all red interfaces are evil. Sometimes red is just an attention getting device, like this floor alarm from the fifth element or this activated alarm from Wally or these pups from Prometheus. Um, these are interfaces that are simply using the color as an attention getting device. Um, and none of these can really arguably said to be evil with the exception of the one in the lower right hand corner, um, also from the fifth element. But Red is very often evil. It's a good signal. Uh, your odds are about 75% that if you see an interface that is primarily red, that's the reason why. But they're not always red. 
Sometimes the interfaces can be sort of a sickly green. This was quite popular right around the advent of personal computing when people began to see sort of CRTs, those old cathode ray, cathode ray tube computers. Um, and that super saturation um, got played up for a little while around then. And then occasionally evil will also show up. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And the um, green accounted for less than a fourth of the total examples that I had gathered up. Uh, and occasionally it's a calculated blue, um, but really there are only like two or three examples of this. Um, as you can see from here, we're looking at Star Wars examples. So when I say that evil is red on black, it's mostly red on black um, with a few exceptions. And if we really want to nail a better generalization, they are all high contrast. Right, the red is super saturated red, the black is usually dark black, or the blue is super saturated blue, and the green is super saturated green. That high contrast super saturation is the first pattern that jumps out at you when you look at a collection of evil interfaces. That's aspect number one. Aspect number two, and this is goofy to say, but evil's pointy. Um, it occurred all over the place in the interfaces that we saw. Uh, they had little points, um, sometimes on devices, oftentimes on the screen, even on the biology of the characters that are evil. Uh, you can see those sort of spiky little talons in these last two images, um, which uh, let's see, the green one is Galaxy Quest and the purple one is from one of the horrible Star Wars prequels. Um, but they're good illustrations that evil is pointy, which gives us these two things, right? What's evil? Evil is high contrast and mostly red on black, and it's pointy. And if really you just want to know what the visual style of evil is, you can leave this talk now. <laughs> that's, that's the basic patterns that we see. I looked for other things. Are there particular types of controls, mechanisms, or paradigms that you can see on screen? And the answer is no, not really. Um, these are the patterns that really stand out. And we could stop there and I could go through lots of examples that sort of illustrate this. But instead, um, what I really wanna do is talk about the nerd part of this, which is to ask why. Why is evil high contrast, mostly red on black and pointy? Um, and when you go a field of science fiction and even interface design, um, you land squarely in uh, the world of phonosemantics and evolution. If you're not familiar with the term phonosemantics, it means that the way a thing appears tells you something about it. And specifically, it's a linguist term that says that the way a word is spoken tells you something about the thing. What you see on screen here are two shapes that were part of an experiment that was originally devised in 1929 by Wolfgang Kuhle, uh, but it was also run again, and here I'm checking my notes, um, in 1949 and 2001 again, uh, and each time it got the same results. Similar to the exercise that we did at the very beginning of our time together today, the experimenters would show these two shapes to the subjects and let them know that one was called a maluma and the other was called a taquete. Now, that was the original uh, cooler version. I think in 49, they changed it to maluma and no, to bauba and taquete. And in the 2001, them, they called it bauba and kiki. So like the Wikipedia article listed as the bauba kiki effect, whatever, they're all, of a sort, but in 95% of, 95 to 98% of the respondents would say that the thing on the left is a taquete and the thing on the right is the maluma. And not having any other information about the objects, like what are they for? Or what do these words mean? People agreed. And what was really interesting is that this was true across cultures. Um, the original one in 1929 tested with 
uh, both English speakers and Spanish speakers. And the one in 2000, the, the retest that occurred in 2001 happened with Tamil speakers in India, as well as uh, English speakers. And the results were the same. So it's not culturally dependent. It's not language dependent. There is something about the sounds of these words that people clearly associate with the shapes in this experiment. That is an example, and it's the canonical example of phonosemantics. And it is my assertion that there is a form of phonosemantics occurring in the evil interfaces. Phonosemantics tells us that there are human universals in the interpretation of forms. And for me, being a big nerd, I like, I love universals when I can find them. I try to pack them into long-term memory. Um, and when I first learned about phonosemantics, I was like, this is awesome. You can learn about what these human universals are, um, and especially as it comes to the design of the things that you do. I was a visual designer in undergraduate, so uh, visual design is still one of my interests. Now, that's what the science tells us, right? There are human universals in the interpretation of forms. The lower part, the one in red, uh, is Chris's conjecture, much less science-based. But I believe that those universals are rooted in our experience of nature and of the culture that arose from that nature. So here we have to take uh, a nerdy turn from linguistics and into evolutionary theory. When we look in nature for things that are high contrast and pointy, uh, it takes us to a division of evolutionary theory called signaling theory, which observes that there are some patterns that recur in nature and tries to answer evolutionarily why would they have occurred. And aposematism is the appearance of high contrast uh, colors like you see here with the black widow and the wasp and the poisonous tree frog and the, and the caterpillar um, that are all either very aggressive like the wasp or unsavory like the poisonous tree frog um, or any of those other ones. And this signal over time begins to both affect individuals who are like, oh, I really don't want to eat that tree frog. I did once. I was sick for days. I'm not going to make that mistake again. But slowly can become embedded in the instincts of predators or prey, which is, whoa, stay away from that thing. There's also some really interesting evolutionary stuff about how um, species can converge. If they're both unsavory um, and they both share a predator, they can evolve similarly to camp on each other's unsavoriness. So that, and you can extend that out even to the whole of the biosphere, which is that there are some patterns that we have just learned mean danger. And in fact, the basis of signaling theory is, a, is an honest signal to pre potential predators and potential com competitors that says, and here's my first F-bomb, don't fuck with me. That's what that pattern means. Um, and it's an honest signal because you don't want to fuck with a wasp or a poisonous tree frog or the black widow if you can help it. There are some really fascinating offshoots of this. Um, once a pattern has been really firmly established in a species, other species that share the environment can evolve to look similar and even identical, um, even though they don't share the same aggression or the same danger um, or the same unsavoriness. Um, you may have heard the rhyme, red on yellow, uh, kill a fellow, and red on black is a friend of Jack. Uh, because we had to memorize, because these snakes look the same, but they're not. The one on the left is actually poisonous, and the one on the right is playing a little game. It's a dishonest signal <clears throat> that as long as it stays uh, to below a certain ratio compared to the number of honest signals out there, it can kind of get away with safety. Um, people might mistake it for the really dangerous or unsavory thing, and it can say in a much more sort of polite way, please, 
don't fuck with me. This kind of mimicry is called the Batesian mimicry, and it's fascinating, and we could have a really long, nerdy conversation about what that might mean for design for human systems. But for now, just be aware that there are many branches of the signaling theory and evolution. So <clears throat> that gives us the high contrast. We see lots of examples with this. Um, one thing that I was quite curious about when I saw these examples is, wait a minute, why don't we see the, the bright, uh, bright yellows in the examples of evil interfaces like we do with the wasp? And I've got a theory. <laughs> and that theory is that the red and the black come from two main things. It comes from blood and it comes from night. Uh, and I didn't want to show real blood on screen because some people get squeamish. So that's a cherry glaze. Don't worry about it. Um, but certainly we are evolved to know that when we see blood in unexpected places, that it's a signal that something may have gone wrong. Something, some violence may have occurred. Um, of course, there are exceptions for uh, routine human things like uh, menstruation. Um, but even with uh, the routine human experience of childbirth, that's a violent thing where you would expect, uh, you may expect to see some blood amongst other things. So blood is a real clear evolutionary signal to us that danger is potentially afoot. And the other one, black, uh, I think comes from the fact that we are a diurnal species. That's one of the other types and, you know, not nocturnal, like an owl or a lemur, um, but we uh, have evolved to work in the day. Our eyes are optimized for day. Um, even though we can't operate at night, we prefer that day and we consider the night to be where dangerous things are. It's certainly where things are better evolved to live there and hunt there. So really blood and night, and this is purely Chris's conjecture, are where those two colors became dominant in evil interfaces. Uh, we already talked about night, right? But uh, if these things are all true, that would explain where this pattern comes from, right? Blood and night give us the mostly red on black. High contrast comes from our experience of the world and those patterns being repeated across cultures. We now kind of instinctually know what they mean. So if that's what the first part of the pattern, we have to ask after the second part of the pattern, and I think if that first one is sort of semantics, the second one is just physical. Pointy things hurt. They evolved to hurt. Thorns hurt, claws hurt, teeth hurt. You know, my two-year-old daughter understands that without under, understanding any of this stuff about aposematism. Um, so I think that's a very physical signal that we just get. Pointiness means danger in a very physical sense, which, for my money, is the explanation of why these two things might be the signals that they are. Um, it comes from our experience of nature and the way nature works uh, and the way our bodies and physics work, which is why evil has a really reliable set of signals in fiction. <laughs>